you do a lot of busy fabric together in a way that if I did it, it would look like my studio floor threw up on a quilt. Okay. I'm kind of a blender girl in a lot of ways because I just like color. Okay. Um, Some people have a skill for that and I'm not one of them. You're listening to Fussy Cutters Club Podcast, a show that gives you permission to cut into the good fabric so you can make quilts you love. And now your host, who believes it's not a crime to love using novelty fabrics, Ange Wilson. Welcome to Fussy Cutters Club Podcast. Today we're joined by Sam Hunter of Hunter's Design Studio. If you're not familiar with Sam, she's an FPP, that's a foundation paper pieced pattern designer. She also designs traditionally pieced quilts. She's a big advocate of quilters being paid what they're worth and making sure that we price our work accordingly. Sam's not really known as a fussy cutter, but Sam inadvertently designs fussy cut friendly patterns. And she's taking a step into supporting fussy cutters with some amendments to her patterns to encourage you to fussy cut them, as well as designing some new patterns that have fussy cut already built into them. I love Sam. We're very good friends and we'll go into that in the episode. I hope you enjoy it. Let's get chatting. Welcome, Sam. Hello, and Yes, that's us busting up before the recording got going. Yeah, that's us. Now, my little cherub, you are coming off the back of a little bit of success in the last 24 hours. You released your Stanley Cup <laughs> foundation paper piece pattern. Which has a fussy cut in it. <laughs> it does. I told you. Like, would be well received? Uh, it's all your fault. No, Kath. Kath and I can take well, a bit of a... Well, yeah, I mean, you, you and Kath. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, th- this was a topic of discussion, what was this, not even 10 days ago? Um, yeah. About the craze of Stanley, what are they calling it? Stanley tumblers. They're calling them Stanley tumblers uh, to make a distinction between the hockey Stanley Cup. Okay? And, yeah. of course, I'm the last person to know about anything. And then it was like, ooh. I bet I could draw an FPP for that. And then I got snowed in. <laughs> <laughs> Those two things are unrelated. Yeah. And then I just, I was bored with myself. And so I sat and doodled one. And then I went through my fabric stash, which does not have a lot of fussy cutting fabric in it, my friends. And I found that little wee sheep and it was just too freaking cute. So that's what I did. <laughs> and and my and lovely I assistant it. ran a test, a, a quick test on it. So it is a tested pattern. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, but yes. I, I was wondering if people were going to be like, oh, that's crass. You know, like. Why? Because you're jumping on the bandwagon, right? That's what everyone does. Oh, I know. I know. But so, someone, <laughs> someone who I think kind of has it together texted me and said, the first thing I did after laughing was say, dang, I wish I'd thought of that. So I feel like exactly for maybe once I'm ahead of a curve instead of lagging behind it. <laughs> <laughs> and and just for the record, I am Team Hydro Flask. I am not Team Stanley Tumbler. I'm Team Cheapo Cup from Woolworths. I don't even know what it is. Yeah, but yes. So that's very exciting, very funny, and we will have links to the pattern and everything down yes. below so people can check it out. I've been thinking of different versions that I intend to make when I get some spare time. Ha ha. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One spare of the time. things about being the chief everything officer is that spare time thing. Yes. So for those of you that are, don't know Sam, Sam, can you tell us a little bit about your backstory, where you come from, why, how you got into quilting, just, you know, the fun stuff. The fun stuff. Uh, backstory. I am British by birth and American by circumstance at this point. I emigrated to the States when I was three. I went back to Britain when I was nine. I came back out again at 19. I married an American bloke. I had a baby who is about to turn 40 years old. And he keeps saying, mom, I'm getting old. And I'm like, dude, shut up. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I grew up sewing though. I had always sewn. The first thing I tried to sew when I was seven years old was Barbie clothes, Mm. uh, little Barbie dresses. And I drew around the Barbie doll and 
then cut it out. And even as I was cutting it out, I was like, wait a minute, there's this, 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 I need this extra room for a seam. Right. And of course it didn't fit, but the second one did. So oh. I was already sort of in that puzzling mode at seven years old. And, and my mom, I, I don't know where she found the courage to do this. She let me actually sew on her machine when I was seven. Um, and then when I was in Britain, I spent a lot of time with, uh, my grandma's, my dad's mom, uh, Nanny Hunter, and my stepmom's mom, Nanny Janes. Nanny Janes had a treadle, and I was in the last class of my high school that did sewing and cookery as uh, standard classes. Uh, so I'm part of the generation that sort of got it in the family and in the school, and all women sewed. And you know, Nanny Hunter was a whiz with a crochet hook step you know stepmom could cable and watch telly at the same time like cable and yeah. fair isle at the same time watching telly nanny james yeah. um did bobbin lace um and i have wow. a little piece of her bobbin lace left in it in a little paperweight um her husband yeah. granddad james uh was a carpenter and he used to turn the, the lace bobbins for so yeah it was always there it was just always there and then i met my first husband and I, I knitted him a Tom Baker Doctor Who scarf while we were recording. <laughs> 20 feet of a colorful acrylic. <laughs> that was about the end of my knitting skills, too. It's like plain and pearl, right? And uh, when I was courting my second husband, I decided to take a class and make, make him a proper quilt. Um, I'd made one quilt before that, and it was... You know, I cut it out with scissors. It had garment size seams in it. It was yarn tied. It was double batted with polyester to the point that it wouldn't drape off a bed for about three years. You know, it sat there like an airplane <laughs> with its wings out. Um, I don't think there was a single corner on it that matched up anywhere. And I suppose learning to quilt properly worked because, you know, I did it while I was courting husband number two. And, uh, you know, he asked me to marry him. Um, I have since thrown them both back. I am on the catch and release program. Um, and, but I, the quilting stayed. You know, I think with quilting, it's pretty interesting. I think um, you either make a quilt and you're like, yeah, all right. Okay, that was a quilt. I don't have to do that again. Thank you. <laughs> Tick. Tick. <laughs> Sorry, my British accent comes out when I'm hanging out with uh, Ange a lot more than normal. Uh, or you get bit by it and then suddenly you are trying to literally wallpaper the world and wrap everybody, you know, in quilts. So yeah. Worse habits to have, I think. Worse habits to have. And then I was teaching in local stores and then I, I, uh, pursued the art degree that I had always wanted as a kid and did my, uh, AA and my, my associate's degree in America in my thirties, my bachelor's in my forties. At the end of my forties, I went to graduate school and got an MFA in fiber art and then graduated to a really terrible economy and turned into pattern design really as an act of desperation. But at that point yeah. I had taught a lot of patterns in stores and I had always been fixing them. And that's really what happened. I was fixing a pattern, you know, like rewriting bits and pieces of it in order to teach it. And a friend of mine said, why aren't you designing your own? I'm like what? <laughs> 14 years so, later. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not, known for fussy cutting no not at all in the first instance mm -mm. but you have a series of patterns called 14 squared is it the 14s the yeah faster 14 yeah. 14 squared 14 on point there are a few other those are the ones that you can get in stores through distributors there are a few other that didn't perform well in the stores but they're still available online one of them's got a churn dash in it churning 14 so yeah these are really fun patterns they cut out of 14 fat quarters and so our mutual friend Kath of Wombat Quilts mm -hmm. has a oh I don't even know what you, a prolificness for making charity quilts. Oh yeah, and, it's it's her passion and quilts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she her go to seems to be fourteen square. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so Kath is a fellow fussy cutter, mm -hmm. and so a lot of her stuff on Instagram and that she's sharing and is fussy cut versions of 14 squared. You've subsequently gone back and written an addendum mm -hmm. to help people fussy cut uh, the 14 series. Yeah. Is there, and now you've released the Stanley Tumblr mm -hmm. with fussy cutness in it as well. Mm. Um, what would you say your bent is? If you had to describe yourself as a quilter, <laughs> like I always go, I'm a fussy cut traditional patchworker. 
mm-hmm. what would you say you were? Mm. To quote um, a really good friend of mine, and I'm, I'm going to pimp her because we, we, we pimp the people that we care about, Teresa Coates. She's the one that made the elemental coat pattern. If you haven't gotten into the quilted coat world, take a look at this pattern. It really works well for a lot of people and a lot of body shapes. And it's, it's very easy to make with a beginner's set of garment making skills. So I'll just say that. A couple of years ago, Teresa, Teresa and I have known each other for like 15 years now. She looked at my pattern, oof, and she said to me, you're all over the place, Hunter. And I said, yeah, I know. <laughs> She's like, what's this about? And I said, well, I just do what interests me. <laughs> so I suppose if you were going to pigeonhole hold me, I would say I do a lot of patterns that appeal very much to what I would call a middle of the road audience or a contemporary traditional audience. I do, I've sprouted a few that are modern. Um, I do like modern quilting. I'm very attracted to it when left to my own devices. I am happy doing traditional patchwork. I'm very happy as a foundation paper piecer. Um, I wrote a book that has foundation paper piecing in it. I do complicated things out of FPP when I need to, but my piecing skills are good enough to not have to rely on FPP to get my accuracy. I'm yep. a very reluctant applicator. I can do it. I can do needle turn applique. Um, I like to say applique is a four letter word twice because it's eight letters. Long. <laughs> and that I'm not going to live long enough to make all the things if I have to do them all by hand, but left to my own devices in fine art, I hand embroider things. Yeah. And so. you do that. We will put links to it, but you, um, that segues into you offer a bespoke textile experience in Mm -hmm. Paris and London Mm -hmm. at the moment with the um, intention that you may go other places as well. Going to research Italy this year. (laughs) (laughs) Mm, Gelato. Um, Mm. That, oh, no, no, sorry. I've lost my train of thought now because I'm thinking about ice cream. I know. It's (laughs) Um, called the embroidered journey. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) And... I will link to information, but really the thing about the embroidered journey is that you are empowering people to tap into their own creativity yeah. in whatever form that takes. Yeah. But one of your chosen outlets is the hand stitching embroidery. Yeah. And, and actually the, 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 the travel journal, it's kind of a combination of both. And, you know, on the embroidered journey, one of the reasons why I chose embroidery, I mean, I'm not known for embroidery. I chose embroidery over quilting because it's, very easy to make it small and portable. And years ago I took uh, a travel journaling class, like an urban sketching class in Paris. And it completely changed the way I navigated the city in order to stop and look for things to draw. And so I've kind of like merged those two together into a little project that we can do. I, I don't hold a gun to anybody's head to actually finish a project I figure, you know, nobody actually needs that level of homework. It's up to them. I've had, I've had women come up, come on the tours with their knitting and they just happily knit their way through our little sewing sessions. Um, But I also get us some really lovely stitching classes from really smart people. Like in London, we went to hand and lock and we learned how to do gold work from a young woman who had done gold work embroidery on the coronation screen for King Charles. Um, you know, that kind of stuff. That's the kind of stuff that I like finding. Um, so, yeah, that's, yeah. I share a similar excitement for that kind of work. Yeah. And just the history of it all. Mm. Um, but History is so fun because it's like, how do you know where you are if you don't know where you've come from, especially as women in fiber art? We have such a lineage of handing. Uh, these are hand crafts, okay? We, we hand them hand to hand to each other. We teach hand-to-hand. Women have always learned hand-to-hand. And a lot of it, it, on the outside, it looks like women got around the quilting frame to make sure that somebody got quilts when they got married. But it's also where the elder women are teaching the younger women, you know, how you make a pie crust, how you calm a colicky baby. I mean, the art of being a woman was taught also at the quilting frame. And I think think that history and the needle are so – tritely knotted up with each other that we can't we can't really undo that yeah and it's um 
it's interesting now in this modern age, women are still gravitating towards each other and using quilting as the icebreaker, Mm -hmm. but then sharing their lives as they grow and move through life stages. Mm -hmm. And it's all around this commonality that we share with fabric and creating. And so, I mean, it's really amazing to think about all the different friendships that are out there because of quilting. And Oh, um, yeah. Like you and me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we're not friends. No. Oh. <laughs> no. In the correct terminology, we're mates. <laughs> we're not friends. Ooh. Buddy. Yeah. But yeah, it is like mm-hmm. we where did we meet? We met at Quilt Market, Quilt Market mm-hmm. in twenty seventeen, I wanna say. Um seventeen? I'm trying to I'm trying to Count this out. When did your book come yeah, out? I think so. Because you were you were debuting your book, and I think uh, I had already debuted mine. Yeah, you went before me. So we're yeah. both with C and T Publishing. Mm-hmm. Sam's book is Quilt Talk, quilt and talk. Um, a great book for making quilts that make a statement. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, I actually think it was twenty seventeen. It was either twenty seventeen or twenty sixteen. Mm-hmm. But around there, because we were back there in 2019, Mm -hmm. but I hadn't been the year before. So, yeah. But anyway, we digress. We met at Quilt Market through Kath. Through Kath. Who's an Aussie who was born in Britain but married to an American chap and lives up the road from me. Yes. Um, (laughs) Oh, we're so international. Um, Yes. And she, Christy, was Christy with me? Christy Christy was was with with you as well. Yeah. We met Christy. Yes. And so Christy is an Aussie FPPR Mm -hmm. um, and one third of the online quilting magazine Make Modern. Oh, best Uh, magazine ever. Mm. Yeah. And she (laughs) was just, I'm just trying to think. We, so Christy and I went over to Quilt Market together. Mm -hmm. At that stage, we lived in two separate states and we met in Sydney and flew over, and now we both live in Queensland, but we're still 1,200 kilometres apart. Mm-hmm. And then we met you guys, and we've basically just stayed in contact since then. Mm-hmm. We play a uh, bit nerdy, but we do play <laughs> online board game together. Yes, we do. Um, and so we have yeah, Andrew daily- thrashes me constantly. <laughs> uh, you give as good as you take, Oh, no, mate. no, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. Matthew wiped the floor with me. Okay, we have a mutual friend. He's a friend of mine but I've introduced him to Angie online and he wiped the floor with me with a maneuver today that had me texting him with rude words and saying, did you learn that from Angie? <laughs> and he said, yes. Yeah. So yeah, See, but, you, you're wild. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, it's my convict blood. <laughs> like, um, so we do have daily contact and then mm-hmm. we both share a, enthusiasm or a passion for making sure that the quilting industry stays alive and it is a place where women can thrive Mm -hmm. and make a living wage which brings me to another thing that you've another feather in your cap you've just done a panel for the modern quilt guild on Mm -hmm. pricing quilts yeah and you are a very big advocate for being paid what you're worth absolutely Do you think we're heading in the right direction? Yeah, absolutely. The first time I started beating this drum, some people would say whining or whinging about it, was, oh, over a decade ago. I mean, my business was brand new and it's it's still on my website. It's called We're So Worth It with so as in S-E-W and the S as a dollar sign because it has to do with money. And it really came about because I was in some Facebook group and someone got on there with a really beautiful baby quilt and said, Ooh, is it okay to charge $85 for this? And I kind of lost, <laughs> I lost it to, to the keyboard. But I will say this, in the decade plus that I have been beating this drum, I see a lot of people beating it with me, uh, taking up that torch. Um, I will say that some of our, the people who are uh, struggling to adjust to charging well for their work are an older generation of women that are not used to charging for needlecraft. I think our younger generation does a much better job of pricing 
than our older generations do. And I think that's just the progress of feminism in a lot of ways. And so, yeah, I do, I do see it moving. And the NQG is interested in the conversation years ago. I went to one of their shows in Pasadena, California. Uh, those were the first ones I'd gone to. I used to work in Pasadena, so I knew how to, you know, get down there, bum a car from a friend, you know, bum a pillow on a couch and be able to go to quilt, quilt con for a heck of a lot less money than one does if you use the host hotels. And I had a lovely conversation with Suzanne Woods, who was on the MQG board at the time. And she said to me, oh, what do you think of the show, Sam? And I said, oh, it's lovely, but these prices, I mean, come on, people, we got to eat these up. And she was like, yes, I know. And I said, well, why don't we have a conversation about that? And when I looked back around to have that conversation, Suzanne uh, was beginning a journey with cancer that took her off the planet. And then we had a pandemic. And after we all got that together, I went back to the MQG uh, with an offering for a lecture last year that wasn't about pricing. And they actually turned around to me and said, Sam, good to hear from you. Uh, we actually would like a pricing lecture. And, um, you know, we know that you talk about that. Would you be so kind as to sort that out. And so I did. And during that lecture where I, I basically took one of my quilts and broke it down um, and then compared it to quilts by people like Sean Kimber, you know, Sean's had two pieces collected by the Smithsonian museum. So, I mean, she's in a vastly diff different echelon and can I just say her work deserves to be collected. I, I couldn't be any prouder for her in any way. I mean, deserving of the accolades. The work is strong. It's so conceptually tight. It's so in line with the Smithsonian's vision. And I say this as an art geek. So it was, it was really, really good. But someone in one of the lectures said to me, this is the 10th quilt con. Why is this the first time we've had this lecture? Why doesn't the MQG care about us? And I said, uh, oh, contraire. They do actually care. So I went back to the MQG after quilt con and I said, okay, people are interested in this conversation. How do we get this education further out than the people who can afford to go to QuiltCon? And they supported me every step of the way, and we brought together a panel that is me and Sean Kimber. Sean grac graciously gave up what non-existent free time she has to do this. And Lucy Engels from Scotland, because I thought it was really important for us to have non-American people uh, represented. And Lucy does a lot of commission work. And we had this wide ranging conversation that I am immensely proud of. And these ladies really stretched my thoughts and opinions about the complexities of pricing in some really amazing ways. So yeah. uh, you can't actually see this lecture unless you join the MQG. I think it's $40 to join. I think it's absolutely worth it for the level of education that they offer you. They're also, this time at QuiltCon, they're doing a lecture pass virtually. So you can enjoy some of the lectures uh, or all of the lectures virtually, even though you can't do the classes virtually this time. I, th I think it's worth it. Is the MQG perfect? I know a lot of people get to be in their bonnet about some of the things they do. None of us are perfect. I think they're a good exercise in trying to do well. And that's the thing that I kind of go is, is I think it's really easy in this day and age oh. where – yeah. People are so ex high expectations of polished and perfection and, and I mean, I'm yeah. guilty of perpetuating it myself on Instagram by not showing the messy side of creating and things like yeah. that. But the MQG in the time that I've been lucky enough to witness their growth, mm. you got to hand it to them. They take feedback really well. They, they take do. constructive criticism really well. Yeah. They are responsive to yeah. those changes. They are committed to their members. And mm -hmm. so Very. Um, I have felt extraordinarily supported by them in all the, the endeavors and interactions that I've had with them. Extraordinarily supported. And so we will have links to checking mm -hmm. them out if that's something that you're interested in as well. Yeah. Lucy is amazing. And again, I will have oh, she's a um, links to that. Yeah. I got to meet her a year and a half ago. I, I decided See, to take a little bit of trouble. time in Edinburgh, and I got to have I got to have family dinner with her. It was wonderful. <laughs> it's wonderful. See, the world of quilting is a small one. Yeah, and I mean, I would say ninety percent of my friendships have come via quilting. And yep. I mean, we were sort of good at FaceTiming here and there, but I I think the pandemic certainly taught us how to invest and maintain in relationships with a virtual connection. 
And I, I feel no less close to you than, you know, having seen you literally once in, in the last decade. <laughs> Wait, considering how often we hang out on a weekly basis, you know? <laughs> Yeah. So we, um, as we said before, we do play an online board game and I think it's really funny because we do play every day, like we make moves every day. And I always think it's funny because through those moves, like we don't communicate, like it's not like you're having a chat while you're playing. You just make a move and then wait for the other person to make their move. Um, But you get an insight into how busy the other person is. (laughs) Because some days I'm making lots of moves and other days <laughs> crickets. Oh, but yeah. So, um, yeah. And from my end, okay, because we've got these, this radical time difference between us, it's like there'll be si- this, this, this silence. Um, I'm playing with all my other friends but not Ange. And then suddenly Ange is online and I'll text her, your feet hit the ground, I heard them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or because I have really bad sleeping patterns at times, I'll make moves or message or something in the middle of the night and you'll be like, why aren't you sleeping? <laughs> like, uh, just this week we've had a whole conversation yes, of whole conversation. I'm awake in the middle of the night. <laughs> yep, go and back you'll be to like, bed. Then, and then the <laughs> next night it's like my turn. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but yes. Yeah, so back to fabric. So you're back not to known as a fusser cutter. I know. No, like, you seriously. know, I've never. I mean, I think. Um, okay, so let me just back up with this. When I started learning how to choose fabrics for quilts, we didn't have celebrity designers, and we never bought fabric in a coordinated tower of a fabric line. Okay. And I got started, and like everybody else, in 1990, what was available in my store had a lot of calico in it. And my wonderful beginning quilting teacher, Marilyn George, never have had to unlearn or relearn anything she taught me. She taught me very well from the get-go. She got me going on batiks, and I was a batik girl for the longest time. And they, one of the reasons for it was a depth of color. I mean, just richness of color. And I am a deep color junkie. Um, I am not a pastel girl by any manner of means, but I never really found a way to sort of use the conversation prints as much. Um, and then when I started designing, we now have the cult of the celebrity designer. We know who made it. They make lines that work together. And we have several people that do really good fabric that fussy cuts really well. Now, Kath, Kath is a fabric aficionado as much as she's a charity quilt maker. Um, She runs the charity quilt program for Portland Modern Quilt Guild. And I am her assistant, or as we like to say, I am her bitch. I do what (laughs) Kath tells me to do. I help her out any way I can. But anyway, she's got old school cotton and steel, Ruby Star, Lizzie House, and she keeps little things. And she uses them to such amazing effect in ways that I can't even dream of. I would say, I would hazard that some of this coordinated fabric line stuff has, uh, because I've done a lot of work for fabric companies, has actually weakened my skill at picking a quilt off a wall or just like going, oh, going like to a going store. fabric. Yeah, and just pulling what works, you know, like starting with one piece and then pulling everything that goes with it. I think it has weakened that skill. And I can't tell you how many times I've been handed a line by somebody and I would look at it and I would go for my kingdom for a piece of purple fabric that I'm allowed to put in this quilt. So a lot of, a lot of the companies are really good because they'll give us access to their basics lines so we can plug in and all of that kind of stuff. But sometimes we can. And often they want you to use every single piece of fabric in there. And I don't mean this with any offense to anybody. Not every piece is a winner. Yeah. You know, or the scale is wrong for what you're doing or, you know, or you need more pop out of something or, or you need more blend out of it. You know, like you'll, you'll try to like lay it out in, in a really great tonal gradation. And you've got a massive step somewhere between uh, medium and light, like there won't be medium lights in there because they're not really interesting to buy most of the time. We found that in batiks, it's re- you can buy all the dark batiks and medium batiks you ever wanted to in your life. Could you find light batiks? Impossible. Yeah. Absolutely impossible. So that's a really interesting hypothesis about mm-hmm. curated bundles. Because I guess the feedback that I always get is, how do you choose fabric? And to me, oh, yeah. mm-hmm. I just go in and choose what I like, yeah. right? So. Yeah. 
but I have realised over the years that seems to be my superpower. Like I don't, yeah. I just go in and and pick what I like. I don't. Yeah. But it. Yeah. And so I've always looked at the bundle as being a great way of empowering people who mightn't have that confidence. They oh, know that it will work. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Which I'm sure you're you're agreeing with as well. Mm. But I hadn't thought about the fact that prolonged use of bundles doesn't I, I th- encourage us to grow. I yeah, guess. Yeah, I think it actually weakened my skills. Um, I yeah. will also I will also say this though: uh, bundles are great starting places, and I can't tell you how many times I would get um, a Hoffman Bali Pop because this is Hoffman's boutique strip pack. Moda has the trademark on jelly rolls, so the rest of us have to use different names. So it's a Bali Pop, and I would flop out these forty pieces of fabric. And there would always be two fabrics in there that a minimum of two that I would have to be like, why is this snotty green in this bundle? And I need to take it out right now and swap it out with something. So I was always willing to modify. And I think, I think it's good for us to look at a given product bundle, but also, you know, cast an eye to it to say, does it actually suit you? Uh, You, and do amazing work uh, of putting a lot of uh, fabric texture together. Uh, you, do, you do a lot of busy fabric together in a way that if I did it, it would look like my studio floor threw up on a quilt, okay? I'm kind of a blender girl in a lot of ways because I just like color, okay? And some people have a skill for that, and I'm not one of them. Now, Kath, Kath doesn't use, like, the the wildly textural fabric that way, like, you know, big flowers, big this, big that. She's good at the little vignettes, yep. the little amazing vignettes. And that's what she did. Well, she wanted to try that pattern. And then before I knew it, she was completely fussy cutting it. And I'm like, wait, no, 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 no. You're supposed to stack up these fat quarters and chop them to pieces and mix and match. And she's like, oh, she was like, oh, bugger that. I don't want to do it that way. I want to do it this way. <laughs> um, and then it was like, oh, well. And then she was like, well, how many of these do I need if I'm going to do it that way? And I'm like, well, hang on a minute. Let me... I'm, I'm the quilt math person, right? So then I yep. sketched it all out for her. And then we were like, well, we should release this for people. Um, and then we did it. We just did it again this week with 14 on point, which is a, it's like a. The economy square one. Yeah. It's not all of an economy block. It's only one turn square and a square. Yeah. It's not that third square and a square and a square that the economy block is. Um, and we did it with that one. And, um, you know, and in these patterns, we made, we made a lot of effort to say you need this many pieces that have a direction going this way and this many pieces that have a direction going that way. And if you're cutting up stripes, how you have to cut it so all the stripes appear the same way, if that's what yeah. matters to you. And and she naturally does it without thinking. Yep. And, she's, and she cuts all these holes in things and doesn't waste fabric. I don't know how to do I it. I know. It's like Swiss cheese, I man. I know. And we will have links to that because this is the thing that got me excited about it. The addendum to the pattern makes a really lovely bridge from someone who's never fussy cut Mm -hmm. to someone who wants to make a successful fussy cut quilt. So if you're dabbling or Mm -hmm. um, you're excited to try it, the addendum is a really lovely, easy way of having someone hold your hand into that world of fussy cutting. And the other thing I always think too is, and you're (laughs) – I like your description much better than mine. I just throw everything at the wall and see what sticks when it comes right. to mix and match. But you don't need 73 bazillion different fabrics to make a no. fussy cut quilt. No. You just need a hero print. And your yes. hero print might be an Anna Maria Horner floral. Mm-hmm. It might be a repo print. It mm-hmm. might be a Camille Ros Kelly yep. rose print. It might be a Star Wars print. It can be yep. whatever you want mm-hmm. and then you just mix and match it with the blenders and the mm-hmm. solids. And mm-hmm. I, in to this day, one of the quilts that I think is absolute genius and I wish I could find it again, I saw someone make a baby quilt in neutral tones. They were like um, beiges and creams and tans with a Dr. Seuss print from – the line that I think Robert Kaufman did where they kind of toned down and they just pulled 
they pulled like the light baby gray of the elephant that Zeus does holding the um mm-hmm. oh what was that movie I can see the fuzzy balls and yeah. someone at home's listening and yelling it's this it's this but they did this print it was from Cat in the Hat mm-hmm. oh and the other one is it the Horton one that, the Lorax who? the Lorax yeah, that's Horton right here Horton, here's a who. But they mm-hmm. pulled these tans and, and neutrals and everything out mm-hmm. of this base print where if you saw it off the bolt, you would have gone, oh, that's a really loud mm-hmm. in-your-face print. And they toned it down and they made it so mm-hmm. refined and mature and mm-hmm. um, really lovely. And it to this day I think of that quilt often Mm -hmm. because I go, that's the perfect example that novelty prints don't have to be immature or childish. Exactly. Some of the quilts when I was early in my quilting journey that I was always just uh, in awe of were ones where people had used a ton of different neutral fabrics, not just one, in a supportive background way. I mean, it's sort of it was a foreshadowing of the way the modern quilt world uses what they call low volume fabric. I resisted the word low volume for the longest time. I mean, coming from an art background, I wanted light value, low texture, <laughs> which to me <laughs> describes it better. Um, but I'm, I'm now on low volume. But yeah, I mean, and, and a competent handling of multiple low volume fabrics is another way to actually quote unquote fussy cut your way into something without necessarily vignetting every last little flower or creature or leaf or anything like that. And it's another superpower that Kath actually has, happens yeah. to have as well. And it's really funny because when I designed the make the cut pattern, which yeah. we'll be doing as challenge number two, um, kicking off on 1st of May, mm-hmm. the background of that quilt was inspired by that exact same thing, that handling of mm-hmm. – the different colours, like the different neutrals, basically. Yeah. And I have always been envious of people who do a really good low volume mm-hmm. background because yeah. I can't, I've never been able to pull it off. I've always been, oh, there's too much colour in that low volume, yeah. it's yeah. too jarring, it's da 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 yeah. And a lot of the people who I follow and will be interviewing over the coming weeks have that superpower and it's just so nice to see it come together. Yeah. And I really like as a pattern designer, you acknowledge all these different superpowers and then you try and support where you can. Obviously, yeah. you can't do everything. Support people who want to go that way. So like yeah. the addendum for mm-hmm. fussy cutting. You did an addendum for your love quilt where we could use kinship blocks. Yeah. In the love quilt. It's one of my favorite quilts that I've made. Again, I fussy cut all my letters you know like there's just your patterns are like you very inclusive and so I think that's a superpower in and of itself thank you I I really want people to have fun yeah you know because what's the point right right exactly I mean uh, uh, as an artist I'm welcome to torture myself on the way to making a piece of art but um, I think it's really important not to torture our customers uh, I, I want you to have fun making stuff, okay? One of the things I think is amazing about the quilting industry is we have the ability to meet you on any ground that you stand on. If you want kits, we got you. If you want process yeah. classes, we got you. If you want product classes, we got you. If you want to do little, quick, small things, we got you. I like writing stuff that uses an up-and-comer's skill set but doesn't look like a beginner quilt, Stuff where as long as you have a relatively consistent seam allowance, it's going to work out for you. I even have some that you get bits together and then you measure them and then you cut the next bit based on that. So whatever you're sewing to, it's going to work. And then I, you know, happily hand people off into the more complicated quilts. And and I have a few complicated patterns. I've done some big FPP patterns that I think are really fun. And I I would love to have the patience to do your Morty. I would love to have the patience to. Let me tell you, Morty's head isn't that big a deal. It's the spiky border. The spiky border is an entire season of Bridgerton. If if you're going to go units of time, right? Okay. (laughs) Well, that brings us to the other thing that we're bonded by is we love a good period piece. Oh, don't we? (laughs) (laughs) 
Totally. We could do a whole podcast on the difference between Bridgerton, the Buccaneers. Oh, what's that one that's set by the seaside? The um, Sanderson. Sanderton. Mm-hmm. What else was there? Oh, Got to have a little Downton Abbey in there too, right? Oh, yeah, Downton. Oh, and The Gilded Age. I just watched season two of The Gilded Age. Oh, oh the costuming in The Gilded Age. Mm. Like there is a fussy cutter on the wardrobe production unit in The Gilded Age that needs to win an Emmy because in season two they do some pattern matching across bodice seams that is <sighs> phenomenal oh, and I'm wow. just like I don't know how they have the patience to do it I like I would give my left leg to roam through that wardrobe department and just touch yeah. and look and hear about the design process every character has such a distinct mm-hmm. personality in their wardrobe mm-hmm. it's just <sighs> mm. <laughs> wow we're both sitting but here going thank god we don't have to wear corsets Right. I said to Grant, I said to Grant the other day, I reckon I could rock a bustle. <laughs> Cause the lady in the Gilded Age, Mrs. Fish, I want to say Fish is her, but she is a plus size lady yeah. and she looks amazing in the period costuming. And I can only imagine how much structural integrity is in it, because mm-hmm. she's quite voluminous in her bosom to support that and then in the buccaneers christina hendrix plays the mother and she has an impressive cleavage yes and the way like just i mean yeah yeah i remember reading imagine at the end of the day they just go oh yeah (laughs) i remember reading an article um and it was uh some fashion designer who had been called in to uh, create a strapless gown for Aretha Franklin. And he was Ooh. quoted as saying, that's not couture, that is architecture. <laughs> you know, it's engineering. It's engineering, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But mm-hmm. worth, totally worth it. So, oh, yeah, it's so gorgeous. We yeah. bond over that. Oh, um, definitely. And oftentimes we'll be like, did you just watch this episode? Of did this, you? This, this? Did you? Yeah. Did you? I'm... Mm-hmm. Miss Scarlet and the Duke is back on PBS, which I love. Another one that's great for costuming. And I haven't seen that one yet. It's a murder mystery. Oh, I better watch that then. I do like yeah. a good murder mystery. And what was the other one? Oh, Funny Woman has just started on PBS as well. And it's set in the 60s. Mid-century and fashion. The, yep. And even just like, what do you call it? The set design yeah. is really amazing as well. And then All Creatures Great and Small has yeah. started as well. Well, I loved Mad Men for the design. I, I know I yeah. know a lot of people who didn't enjoy Mad Men because, you know, it is the raging sexism of the 60s yeah. and racism and bigotry and all of the problems with the 60s made evident. Uh, visually, it was stunning. But for me, what was really fascinating about Mad Men is – it's set, the first season is set in the year that I was born, and I found it to be sort of an excavation of what was going on with my mom and dad, and especially after we had emigrated to the United States. And um, I saw in the various female characters in Mad Men, I saw pieces of my mother in there, like her her desire for a career that didn't have a child her being stuck by having a child because she had a child when we didn't have birth control. She didn't have a lot of choices, you know, and, and how the frustrations of women and their roles and the navigation of all of that while they were, you know, like flexing their wings in all of these different ways. I thought it was a very interesting historical dive um, into what was going on that was just wrapped up in the best costuming, set design, color, cars. I love cars from the 60s. And all that kind of stuff. And, you know, those sharp suits the men's were wearing, you know, little tight little trouser leg, you know, it's really, really good stuff. Yeah. And that's, but that's my gateway into quilting. So, yeah. I'm a big fan of set design. And a lot of times my favorite shows aren't favorite shows because of the dialogue, it's yeah. their favorite shows because I get lost in in the world that they create. Yeah. And the thing that always captured my imagination was quilts the way that they used quilts or where quilts would pop up 
in Mm -hmm. shows and things like that. And which brings me to the next thing that you and I bond over, Disneyland. Mm. But when we went to Disneyland, California, one of the things that I got such a cheap thrill out of was in Pooh's Corner there's a store that has all vintage singer machines um, and like sewing kits and everything er, like as set decoration and then they have like partially completed quilt tops in there and then when you go on the tall ship the sailing ship that goes around the lagoon not the paddle boat the other one it has in the cruise quarters all the bunk beds on the ship have old school traditional quilts they on do the beds. yeah on the Col- like that's a- the Col- no it's not the columbia the columbia is the paddle no. ship isn't it i don't remember no, yeah, that's the, the – now, now I'm going to have to get yeah. back in my Disney history. I'll have to Google. Yeah. But I took photos and I'll if I can find them, I'll pop them in the um, show notes and everything. But, yeah, they've got quilts on the beds, which just – I have And no they idea. are period piece quilts. They're not like repos or anything. So, wow. Um, and there's quilts pop up in the part of the Caribbean ride in their yeah. set mm-hmm. as well. And so, like, they're everywhere, which yeah. I love. As are quilters, actually. I think you only have to go through like four people before you find a quilter. Oh, yeah. And when we moved up back up here to the tropics, I was like, I'm not going to find a quilter. We were moving in the day we moved in and one of the guys moving our stuff went, oh, do you sew? And I'm like, yeah, I'm a quilter. And he went, so's my mum. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, of course. Of course. The tropics. <laughs> we're all yeah, quilters we're hang out. Take over the world, you know. <laughs> Well, it is a what, $5 billion industry in the United States? Yeah, second only to golf. So Luxury sport. That, yeah. It is. I just find that staggering. And to think that women could have a chunk of that money to support their families and themselves and – you know, I was at one of the one of the quilt markets where the first the first time they talked, they, they, that number was mentioned in in one of the keynote addresses. And I think at the time it was like three point six billion, and I think the last time I saw that number it was four point six billion. So it's rising. And I remember pretty much everybody for the rest of the day going, "Oh, I don't know who's getting the three point six billion, but it ain't me." You know. Yep. <laughs> um, yep. And that's you know that's what I'm fighting for is that we get a little bit more of that three point six billion. Yep. It should be possible. Yeah, and which brings me to another plug for you is you have a Substack yeah, platform Revcraft that is. you mm-hmm. that you write about all of this stuff, yeah, um, and that you unpack these issues as they impact our industry. Yeah, I always enjoy it. I always learn Thank something you. and yeah, have another I, perspective. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this growing into a place where we have a lot of conversations like this conversation that I had with Sean and Lucy about pricing. I mean, I've had my thoughts about pricing for a very long time. And then I get into this conversation with Sean and Lucy and it was like having my brain stretched. They brought up so many different facets that matter in their lives that don't matter in mine. You know, I'm a white American woman, uh, Sean is a black American woman, so her experience is remarkably different. Lucy is a European woman. Um, her experience is remarkably different. And Lucy actually comes from printmaking before she got into quilting. Sean comes from knitting. You know, my bachelor's is in sculpture. So, I mean, we've all got these, like, weird things. But what I want to do in the Substack and in further projects around it is to have the conversations because it's in the conversations that, number one, my thoughts get you know, pulled apart and broadened. But in the conversation is the point where we can say, well, what part of this isn't working for you? And what do you think it would take to sort it out? Because I think if we can start talking about potential solutions and we can start seeing what those solutions look like, we can start working towards them. Just a matter of, you know, redirecting the ship. And I'd like some of that to happen before I die. I mean, I, I, I love that we've had some progress in the last decade, but I'd like to see more. Yep. And I'm I, the, thing that that. I, <laughs> <laughs> the thing that I really enjoy about it is you and I don't come from a same world view. So mm-hmm. I'm I'm a Christian and so that, you know, we have some really strong points of difference between the two of us. Yeah. But yeah. we're able to talk about them. It's never been a thing where you shout me down or I shout no, you down. or no. 
we've always been able to go through and go, all right, well, this is how I see it. Yeah. This is how it impacts my world. Mm-hmm. You're the same, you know, mm-hmm. um, those conversations are there to be had. And, mm-hmm. and through that, I don't, the, the safe space to have the conversation, the supportive framework to have that mm-hmm. conversation, the fact that no one has to be right. Like, yeah. I mean, there is being right and then there's being ego-driven right and yeah. so that's that's not there. It's about understanding. It's about how do mm-hmm. we make a world that is better for people yes. and that's always something I've really admired about you is that you don't shy away from the hard conversation but at the same time you want to bring people with you. You don't just want to steamroll them into this is the way I see it. Yeah. And you'll do this amazing thing where you'll go, I'm wrong or I didn't quite understand it, I didn't see it that way, I'm happy to change. There's no, I want to say there's no ego to it, whereas for some people it's a real matter of pride to be right or to be the loudest in the room or yeah. to have everyone accept their way as the right way and and that's not very beneficial for any of us. No, thank thank you for that because I do feel that, I can be really strident about what I think is right. You know, I, there are certain things that I just see. I, I don't have a lot of latitude in how I think about them, uh, you know, uh, and I argue those points. But at the end of the day, those are the points that work for me. And I, I think, in, as you say, we, we have to really look at the fact that everybody stands in a different pair of sneakers. Um, yep. So not all solutions work for everybody. And I'm finding, and, and maybe I, you know, I don't, I don't even know. I don't even quite know. Did, did, I mean, did the pandemic rattle this? I mean, we, we've got such polarized politics all over the world right now. And there's this kind of idea that either I'm with you or I hate you with every fiber of my being and I want your eternal destruction. And it's like, well, no, not at all. I just actually just don't see it the way you do. And I don't necessarily agree with you unless you're like down the road of really bad hate speech you know, I will find a way to listen to you. I mean, if you're in hate speech, I'll, I won't listen very nicely, but I think, I think the conversations matter more now than they ever did. Uh, yeah. and I think that I've, ha- I've, I am so fortunate to have amazing colleagues in this industry, such as yourself, where, you know, Angie's one of the few people where I can call up and I can give her the nitty gritty and the financial data and I don't feel like at all that I'm in risk of having any of my, my stuff stolen. Um, and that, that isn't always the same way when you're in public forums. You'll come up, you'll, you'll be scratching an idea. And before you know it, someone else published, somebody else published your Stanley Tumblr, you know. Um, <laughs> so, but the richness of the conversations that I've had over the years where I've worked to have more conversations in order to strengthen my own understanding – has made me see so much more nuance and the more nuance I can see, the more nuance I can point out. And hopefully by pointing out a lot more nuance, like I'm working on a piece right now. We had a a bit of an explosion. A tempest in a teacup was provoked before Christmas about whether or not you should pay pattern testers. And people were basically asking me for a hot take. And it's like, it's not a hot take issue. I can't do it in a hot take. It's actually at the moment, it's probably a 2000 word essay that needs to be carved back, but it's that complicated And one of the things I try to go in is I try to go into my historical experience with it, like where I was with it 14 years ago when I started doing this to where I am today when I'm doing it. And the fact that all of us would want the grace to be allowed to change for the better. Yep. Right. And that's, that's the thing you were saying before, you know, you, you um, will stridently defend if you think something is right, but you never lose fact of the, of the humanity of the other person. It's Thank not you. at the cost of that person's humanity. And that's a massive difference in this day and age yeah. where people resort to name calling and mm. bullying and those mm. kind of tactics to be the loudest in the room. And that's not helpful for any of us. And no. it's the same with fabric, right? Something as basic as fabric, you see it online all the time where people belittle other people's decisions or poke holes in someone else's work or um mm-hmm. or 
or mock it or, you know, go, oh, at times give really what I'm sure is feedback that comes from a lovely place, but they're like, oh, I would never have put those two things together. It's not I really admire that you've seen something different and you've gone with that. It's ugh kind of thing. And I'm like, you crush so much possibility in the world by doing that. Yeah, I mean, having gone through graduate art school, which in which critiques are essentially blast furnaces, you just stand there and try not to cry. And I try so hard now to say, do you want critique? (laughs) Uh, You know, are, are you asking me for my opinion Because I'll come in and and as anybody who knows me and loves me anyway, I'm as blunt as a two by four. I think we, the online forum gives everybody the ability to have a pulpit at their fingertips and people opine where they should just read and people froth when they should just walk on by people. (laughs) Just walk on by. (laughs) These are vegetables you don't like. You don't have to say anything about them. So uh, I think it's super important like a lot of people, I, I got I got told in kindergarten I drew something the wrong color. I colored outside the lines. I think I made an elephant purple. And it crushed my spirit. And it took me years to come back and get the art degree I had always wanted and a heck of a lot of therapy on board on the way to be able, and even then after art school, to be able to get to a place like I have an MFA. My MFA is in fiber. I don't actually draw very well. Like with a pencil in my hand, I have to work really hard. Do not play Pictionary with me. I will cry. I will cry (laughs) if I have got to draw an ironing board in a hurry and then have somebody say that looks like a goat throwing up and I will be in tears, right? So it's like you've got to be kind with these gentle spirits of wanting to try art. And that's why I love the fact that we can help somebody with something like a kit. Um, yeah, but I also think that we also need to be a little bolder and maybe in less of a hurry. Cause, uh, one thing that's really in American culture, productivity is everything. Okay. Everybody's counting their thing. How many more did you make? How many, f- yeah. and how fast can you make it? All this stuff. If you put it on the wall and something is eyeballing you, give it a moment, sleep on it, be brave and swap it out. I unpick fabric out of quilts that make, that are wrong. I will leave a bad, you know, a misconnected point in, but I will pick out a bad fabric. And I think, and and maybe Ange, you and I should come back and and say, okay, you've got it on the wall. What are the tricks you try now? What would you do now? Make it bigger, make it smaller, make it lighter, make it darker. Like what are, what is, what is the tool bag? Take it off the wall and never look at it again. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Stuff it in a box. (laughs) Hand it over to Kath because she'll do something with it. She'll turn it into an amazing charity quilt because she'll fix it for you. Um, But yeah, I I think we need to maybe slow down a little here and just really take a look at it and don't go, is this Instagram perfect? Who cares if it's Instagram perfect? Does it make you smile? Are you going to be happy when you walk by it? Or when you walk by it every day, if you walk by it, are you going to go, I wish I had sorted that out before the quilter got to it? Well, then sort it out now. Just sort it out now. And I think it's that thing of um, this is my rule with fussy cutting, right? You need to be self-aware and that is a massive task in Mm -hmm. our culture of noise, right? So to be able to take a beat and listen to yourself because instinctually I firmly believe that every person knows what they like, that they know that they like that colour over that colour. They know that they like this print over that print. The problem is we dampen down that knowledge because we're so keen to be accepted and loved that we go with what's popular and trendy and and I'm as guilty as the next person. I oh, yeah. have a, a collection of fabrics that I purely bought at the time because I was like, I oh, want to be trendy. Uh, um, peer pressure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so I get it. I understand it. But yeah. the thing that I have experienced over the last 10 years of creating is that none of that made me happy when I mm-hmm. saw it on the wall. They were the projects I struggled to finish and I resented at mm-hmm. the end. And now when I do something, if I can look at it and it makes me smile and it's happy, I don't care what anyone else says. Because Mm -hmm. I think this sounds really woo-woo, but when you're happy making blocks, and 
you can't see me, but I keep looking over at the blocks on my wall at the moment because I'm really digging them. It comes through, like it just shines yeah. through your work. And so that confidence, that's the reason mm-hmm. we started the podcast is we wanted that. I wanted to give people the confidence to cut into the fabric that they love. Oh, absolutely. To- we're we're buying it. I mean, people are putting additions onto their house to house their fabric stash. we got to cut this stuff up, people. You know, she who dies with the most fabric doesn't win anything. You're still dead. Yeah, like. her girlfriends do, though. Her girlfriends, if somebody knows what they're doing. And my son knows to call the quilting girlfriends when I go. <laughs> um, so, but no, I mean, you got to cut into it. You, um, you, and you got to have fun with it. And and I, I say this all the time because people say to me, oh, I'm no good with color, Sam. And I'm looking at these women. They are beautifully dressed. They are beautifully accessorized. They've got their makeup on in ways I didn't learn how to do that. I I just I have a stick of mascara and chapstick, right? <laughs> just like a lip balm. I don't even bother. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, that's about where I'm at. I never learned how to do it, and I see these women who create beauty in their home and beauty in their presentation of self, and then they tell me they don't know what they're doing with their fabric, and I yeah. can't help but wonder if we've planted that idea in their heads. And I kind of really want to give anybody who feels that way permission to come to Angie or I at any time and get a permission slip to take it right back out. Yeah, I've not thought about it in terms of what do we culturally do to women to, and like this is where you and I sometimes diverge because mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't tend to look at um, my mum and I were joking the other day, we're simple folks who like a simple laugh and so I don't do much deep diving into culturally what the world is showing me is right for women or right for mm. men or and I don't often think about you know I try to be more mindful of the privilege that I have in my life that's afforded oh, to yeah. me and and make sure that I am not doing anything to impinge on other people and that I am building people up yeah. in my day to day but yeah I do wonder if there's something more I'm going to have to go away and think about it, Sam, see if there's something more I can do do to encourage women. Yep, scroll through the Instagrams and you are going to see 80% of the content, especially if it's marketing content, not necessarily your mate like me who's got a new new pattern and I'm putting it out on Instagram because I have to sell. I mean, I'm a businesswoman. I'm going to sell my things, right? If you, like, you look at the trend for studio minimalism, studio minimalism is about opening your wallet, they're trying to sell you the products to make your studio look that way so that you can feel acceptable. Yeah. So the first thing they're going to do is they're going to create discontent. So they create discontent by design in order then to market to you. And I think you just have to be aware of that. I mean, every, uh, you know, I, I'm at a point where half my Instagram feed is anti-aging products because I mean, <laughs> you know, anti-aging products and bras that keep the girls up without wires because they're more comfortable for the older woman, you know, I mean, just, you know, um, it, no, I mean, it is really interesting. Like it yeah. is really interesting. And I, yeah. at times I enjoy the extra depth of thinking about how, yeah. how things are, do, are done and making sure that I'm not perpetuating mm-hmm. stuff that I, yeah would not like to have perpetuated on me, if that makes sense. Yeah. And then other times I'm like, man, just let me play in the fabric. Let me make what I love. Let me do. Exactly. But again, I'm going to come back here and tell you what you do well. One of the things you do well is you create a safe community for people to come. Like the 100 Blocks projects you do, everybody comes in and they do it with a completely different catalog of fabric. Like my, my, my kinship is all orange and white. I love orange. Sorry, guys, it's orange and white. My... I, I, I make things in orange and white when left on my own devices and, and all this kind of stuff. But in a supportive community like the ones that you've created for these 100 Days projects, people can come in and be safe. And they get community, which is very inclusive, okay? And nothing about the community is being fed to them as, oh, if you didn't use Tula fabric for this, you're kind of not, not in the in crowd here. You know what I mean? It's just like, come on in, bring the fabric that you have. We'll help you make something pretty with it. And I think that's a super important place because 
I mean, well, especially after the pandemic, we can be so isolated in our creativity. But it's purely selfish, right? Because I just really dig seeing what other people do. And so it's that, like, I get a smorgasbord of seeing what other people do. And because I get to see what other people do, it influences how I do things and how I see color and pattern and print Mm -hmm. and all that sort of stuff. And Mm -hmm. it's just, I would love a world where everyone just did what made them happy with fabric. And I I think the speed at which we're sold fabric collections, the speed at which we're sold the idol of busy um, and the fact that we have to do everything and make everything and and I love having an in a deep stash but I use my stash I I don't bring anything into that stash that I'm not gonna use and so I kind of go I just that would be my goal if I left this planet and there were more people on it that were having fun with fabric and not feeling the pressure to create something that is not them, I would consider that a win. But like I said, I'm a simple girl with simple yeah. pleasures. And, and I love that <laughs> legacy. I think that's an amazing legacy. I want mine to be that everybody got paid a little better. Yeah, well, see, yours is actually going to impact people in a way. In a way. <laughs> they'll be poor with mine, but no, they'll be happy. No, no but, but look, if we, if we pay, if we some. If we somehow pay our pattern designers, our fabric designers, if everybody makes a little bit more money, then we're and and does it in a way where we're not all in chronic burnout, having to do sixteen different things at once, you know, and all of them being you know twenty hours a week on social media. If we can help the purveyors of the industry to make a little more money, they will keep making what we want. Yeah, we're still going to have all these amazing products made by creative people. So it's in our best interest to support this, right? Yeah. Because if if we're not paying for our products, our best designers are going to walk away. And then yes. where, where are we going to be, you know? So. Yep. Which ties it up nicely because let's it face does. it, Sam, yeah. you and I could talk about. And we uh, have. A lot. <laughs> Forever. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Into the wee hours of anything. But But that's what I like, right? Thanks for letting me come and and just natter on about the stuff that's important to me, even though though I am barely earning a a bronze star as a fussy cutter here. (laughs) I think fussy cutting is a, a, um, what do they call it? A characteristic, not necessarily an application. Uh Does that make sense? Absolutely. (laughs) It's a mindset. It's It's a mindset. mindset. (laughs) But, yes, thank you for coming and we will – well, we're going to talk to you again because we've got Bake Club. And, Bake Club's coming. Yep. And, you know, we'll probably just have another natter anyway because. Yeah, because we, we do. do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. But thank you for joining us. Thank you. Take care, people. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Fussy Cutters podcast. Enjoyed listening? Why not subscribe so you'll never miss an episode? Did you know the quickest way to the heart of any podcaster is to leave a review or recommend the podcast to a friend? It's true. It is. Until next week, get out there and fondle that fabric.